in our worship this evening, we consider what it is like to, to serve our Lord. Um, the parable of the workers in, in the vineyard. We begin with our opening hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord God, you call us to work in your kingdom and leave no one standing idle. Help us to order our lives by your wisdom and to serve you in, in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 55. It includes a reminder that God's way of doing things is not like our way of doing things, but it is infinitely higher. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. A lesson from Philippians chapter 1. 
But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you what is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord.
This evening we consider the rest of the story. The rest of the story of, about the, the workers in the vineyard. What would you have done today if this had happened to you yesterday? If you had worked from sunrise to sunset under the hot sun, working in a vineyard, only to find at the end of the day that those who only worked a single hour received one denarius. And you had certainly expected that you're going to get some kind of multiple of that when the boss gets to you. So maybe not so irritated that he kept you, you waiting. But when he gave you just a denarius, well, yesterday you grumbled and complained. But what's the rest of the story? What would you be doing today? When would you go out looking for work? Would you be back out at sunrise, ready to work the full day? Or would you be careful to show up as late as possible, 5 o'clock, hoping still to get a full day's pay? And I think your thoughts the day after might run along these lines. Not only was the landowner unfair, but he was dumb. Who does business like that? How is he going to get anyone to give him a full day's work for a day's wages? No, he's got it completely turned around. And you would think, well, that business is going to go down. What company can do that? And the answer, ultimately, for us is just one. And for our purposes this evening, I'd like you to think of it simply as the grace company. That characterizes how God does things, and it also then comes to characterize how we do things. One of the things that they, they teach um, seminary students about writing sermons um, that was new to me when I first heard about it is to ask the question, where, where do I stand in the text? What that means is when I study the text, what, what position am I going to take regarding the text? Whose perspective am I going to, for example, tell this story from? And there is absolutely nothing in this gospel reading that would suggest that Peter is the right one for us to think about, to, to stand there with Peter in this text uh, and consider what that story was meant to convey to him. It was in the 13th century that somebody came up with the helpful idea to divide the books of the Bible into chapters, make it a whole lot easier to find things, especially in the the bigger books, the, the longer books. But they didn't, they didn't always get it right. And here's a case where they made that mistake. They cut off an important part of, of the story. So here's a, another part of the rest of that story. A rich young man had come to Jesus asking, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? He certainly thought that he had done well already and that whatever it was, he could do what was demanded. But then Jesus had a different direction to point him in. He could have just said, you can't do it you can't earn God's favor or salvation by keeping the law. He had what was, I suppose, a more painful way for that rich young man to figure it out for himself. 
He told him, go sell everything you have. Give it away. Then come and, and follow me. And that young man went away sad because he had, he had great wealth. In doing that, Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. So he went away sad, but Peter is still thinking about that promise of treasure in heaven for somebody who left everything and, and followed Jesus. Because Peter is thinking, hey, we are already doing that. He said, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus answers in a way that might seem to be a, a quick, simple, complete answer to Peter. Jesus told him that when he returns to sit on his glorious throne, the 12 disciples would each sit on thrones alongside him, and that everybody who had left home or family for him would receive a hundred times as, as much. But Jesus also recognized that there was something dangerous about Peter's question that he, he needed to address. The 19th chapter ends the same way as this, this parable ends, that many who are last will be first, and the first will be last. You see, that story of the rich young man doesn't end there. It flows directly into this chapter, a chapter that ends, as I said, with that same warning. The warning, the warning tells us it is a dangerous thing to question God's generosity. To question God's generosity, that would, would be a matter of them asking Jesus to give us what we deserve because after all, we deserve more. And in asking that, it would be to forget that our hope, our hope rests alone in the grace of God that has given us the opposite of what we have deserved. Yes, we're led to confess we deserve pay, but the work that we've done for that pay earns the wages of sin, which is, is death. And Jesus, Jesus, in telling the story of these workers in the vineyard, only that first group of laborers is told exactly what they'll be paid, a denarius. All the rest are told, I will pay you whatever is right. Now, there's a, there's a reason why the landowner wanted his, his foreman to pay those who had worked just one hour first. That was so that it wouldn't be, well, those who worked the whole day would get their denarius and go on their way. He wanted them to be around and to wait. He wanted them to see what he had given those who worked just one hour. So waiting, waiting, wouldn't they have expected a significant bonus on what had been promised to them? But that's not what the landowner did. And so when they received their denarius, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Notice what they were really upset about. You have made them equal to us. We're better. We deserve more. How dare you make them equal with us? But the landowner 
isn't going to change his position. His position really is a matter of turning everything upside down. He asked them, are you envious because I am generous? That's really what was at work there. Now the parable is going to end with the same warning. So the last will be first and the first will be last. And the parable really explains what that means. Those first workers will be the last. And the last workers, they will be first. Now here are the things that come in the next chapter. There's, there's more to this story than the rest of the story. After this, Jesus announced that they were heading up to Jerusalem and that when he got to Jerusalem, he would be arrested by his enemies, mistreated, he would be crucified and rise again. After that announcement, James and, and John chose to have their mother go to Jesus with, with a request. You see, just as Peter was still thinking about those thrones, they were too. They wanted the two closest thrones. It wasn't enough to promise to be promised one of the twelve thrones closest to Christ. They wanted the two closest ones. And this set off uh, an argument between the, the disciples, which was not a one-time thing. It was a recurring thing that they wanted to find out and decide which of them was the greatest. And so that warning was for them also because that was thinking along the lines of, you know, Jesus owes us more because we've been here first. So then the ten, they're indignant with the brothers. Jesus then gets the attention of his disciples and he, he tells them, I do things differently. He says, you know, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Things are different in the kingdom of grace. They're different because this king is different. Now, Jesus did not say, whoever among you wants to be great should just stop it. Don't be so proud. He doesn't tell them to stop it. He tells them where true greatness lies. That whoever among you wants to become great must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And here's the foundation for this. The explanation for that strange way of giving gifts and rewards to the worker. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. His kingdom is characterized by grace. The giving, not of what we deserve, but giving the opposite of what we have deserved. At, at the cross of Christ, we see him doing that. At the cross of, of Christ, we see his greatest glory when he served us in laying down his, his life for us, ransoming us. And so that's what characterizes his kingdom. It's a kingdom characterized by, by grace. And so we need to consider what, what we think about when we consider the things we are to do in order to serve him. It's not an unusual, rare sort of thing, but I would expect that it's a continual battle for, for all of us. That we find ourselves needing to consider something that we know God wants us to do. And we struggle with the thought, it doesn't pay. 
What's the point? Nobody is going to notice. The problem with that could be answered by saying, but this is not about you. This is not about you. It is about your Savior. Calling us back to the recognition that there is no higher privilege than being called to reflect the character of our King in the way we deal with one another. Now that too is an ongoing challenge. We're constantly challenged to think, well, they should take care of that themselves. Somebody else should do it. It shouldn't be my job. But we're called to a higher purpose, to reflect the greatest glory of our King in the way we treat other people. That is to be the rest of our story. Because this is what characterizes God's rule over all things. He's not a God who gives us what we deserve. He's a God who gives us the opposite of what we deserve. We've, we've asked for, for death, we've earned death. But in return, he gives us life. Life in his kingdom. Jesus' death changes everything. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Amen. We remind you that uh, you have the opportunity to leave your offerings in the, the box in the narthex as you depart from the service. And uh, now we will uh, join in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver, saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. Gracious Father, you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son you love. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, and all of this only by your grace. All too easily, we react to what you ask us to do for others with the attitude, that doesn't pay. Let someone else, someone less important than me, take care of that. Like the disciples, we return repeatedly to arguments about who among us is the greatest, acting as if we don't know what true greatness is. We have life only because we have seen the greatness of Christ who did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for the many. Help us remember that to work in your vineyard is pure privilege and to pay pure grace. Guard us against questioning your grace shown to others so that we do not lose it ourselves. In the confidence of your unchanging grace, help us imitate our King. You have given us the privilege of reflecting the greatest glory of our Savior by treating others in grace. You will give us what you have promised, and certainly what you give us will be gracious and right. Lord Jesus, author and protector of marriage, we thank you for all the 
the blessings you have given to and through Mike and Ruth Blawa, who are celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary, and to Albert and Carol Fisher, celebrating their 74th wedding anniversary. We pray that your love for your bride, the church, will continue to be their joy and strength. Lord, we commit to you care all who are sick or suffering. We pray especially this weekend for Pastor Lauersdorf, who continues to, to deal uh, with, with back pain that severely limits what he is able to do. We pray for Jim Laubenstein, who is hospitalized with aspiration pneumonia and in intensive care. We pray also for Irene Butzlaff, who was hospitalized but able to return home this week. We pray that you would bless their care and treatment, that above all you would comfort and strengthen their hearts in the assurance that your love is faithful and that you will keep all your promises to them. We also commit to your care Linda Krieger, who is having surgery in the coming days. Watch that no harm accidentally come, come to her. Bless her through her time of rehab and recovery. But above all, we pray that throughout all of this, that you would give her comfort in your precious promises and the faithfulness of your word. All this we ask, Jesus, in your name, and in your name we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Yes. 